very important. Uh, yes, the, the movies were the great escape. Um, there was a, a milk bottle. In those days, uh, milkmen used to deliver milk to the doors of homes. And a milk bottle, one bottle, was returned, and it was worth three cents, okay? So, to go to the movies on Saturday morning was nine cents. So my mother used to give me three milk bottles to bring back to the grocery store to get the nine cents to go to the movies. When you went to the films, you saw <clears throat> Abbott and Costello, you saw 10 cartoons, you saw a serial, Buck Rogers, um, and occasionally you'll see a, a very tame Western. And uh, it kept you in the theater for about two hours. Mm -hmm. And of course, the theaters in those days were not air conditioned. So in the summer, there were fans. And there were wild things. Kids did wild things. We used to come with tomatoes and throw them into the fans. And um, sometimes one of our friends didn't have the nine cents. So we'd go in and then sneak down and open the exit door and let them sneak in. Normal stuff. Yes, in those days, uh, it was uh, uh, primarily double features. Mm -hmm. Double features and also um, Tuesday night, which was notoriously for some reason a bad night for movies. Uh, you went and you saw a repeat film and most adults went and you got a plate or sometimes you got a cup. And if you went enough times, you got a whole set. As a matter of fact, that's how I saw uh, Gone with the Wind. Uh, my mother took me on a Tuesday night and she was gonna get the plates. And I thought I was going to see um, The Wizard of Oz. And all through the picture, I kept saying, but where's the wizard? Where's the wizard? Because my mother had to tell me it was the Wizard of Oz or I would never sit with through Gone with the Wind, okay? But it was, uh, it was a great experience going to the theater. The movies were a great escape. And for me, I think the greatest impact they had wasn't so much that I ever really desired to make movies, it was, for me, the great escape to see what the rest of the world looked like. And so that was really the, the primary interest. Now, eventually, years later, I made a film <clears throat> called Yellow Hair and the Fortress of Gold. And Yellow Hair and the Fortress of Gold is constructed very much like a serial. Yes. The characters are introduced at the beginning. We're, going, then, out, we're going there uh -huh. in a week a while, yeah. But it was based on what I was seeing as a kid. Yeah. Not at all. As a matter of fact, I never thought of cinema. I never had really, as a child, the cinema was pleasure. Uh, I was in love with Rita Hayworth. When I was a kid, I thought she was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. Um, and we lived in what is known as a tenement. So when you saw some of the lavish things, uh, of Hollywood in the, in, the, in the 30s and 40s, especially in the 30s, uh, emphasized lavish wealth because they knew the public was in big trouble and it was part of the escapism. The films always depicted people who of the upper classes, of the uh, Park Avenue, uh, the, the, the Blue Bloods. And so you got a taste of the, the other part of life, whether it was true or not, was, was not it. But no, films did not influence me at all in terms of where I saw myself going in the future. My sister was seven years older than me. My sister was a, a young genius. 
and she was the hope of my family. My mother and father doted on my sister. And I hated her, okay? Because she was always getting all the attention. She got the piano, she got all the, the things. On Saturdays, my mother and father worked. So my sister had to babysit me or watch me, okay? And she would go to Carnegie Hall on 57th Street and 7th Avenue. The back of Carnegie Hall was studios where, where teachers were, etc. And so she had to take me there. And when she took me there, one day, she made friends, okay, with a lady who taught acting. And I was about, I was about 12 or 13 years old. And she needed somewhere to leave me. She knew I was bored listening to her do a music lesson or a piano lesson or a vocal lesson. My sister eventually became an opera star. So what happened, she, she got friendly with this lady and she put me in, into the classroom to keep me there. It turned out that the classroom was operated by a man named Michael Chekhov. And Michael Chekhov's wife was a woman, a wonderful woman named Vera Solovyova. And she was one of the leading ladies of the Moscow Arts Theater. And the two of them had trekked across the, the cold Russian winter with Akim Tamarov, okay, and a few other very famous uh, Russian actors and escaped to the West. So that actually in the beginning of my, my interest in this, in theater, was uh, listening to Michael Chekhov and, and, and but mostly Vera Sol Solovyova. The wife was really the one who did it. Then at one point, Michael went to Hollywood. He left for Hollywood to do coaching. So in any event, I stayed on with Vera Solovyova. It was the blessing of my life. Now, I never had an interest. I never saw myself as an actor, but I used to love when she would assign scenes to the actors, I used to love to help stage it, you know, and before you know it, that's what I was doing. And of course, the wonderful exercises that Michael Chekhov gave us, physical exercises, sculptures, etc., cetera, and, and uh, uh, the improvisations, um, the uh, sense memories, all these things I was getting at a very young age, and I, it came to the point where even when my sister wasn't going to Carnegie Hall, I would go. So for that day, I would forsake baseball, because I love playing sports, to go, and that's how uh, love of theater started.